Today is our last day in the book of 2 Corinthians. We've been in Corinthians for four weeks. And today what I'd like to do is survey three topics, spend about 10 minutes on each one, and then uh, finish out the book. 2 Corinthians has more on the subject of leadership than any other book in the New Testament. So if you are a leader, uh, I would encourage you to really spend some time in 2 Corinthians. In fact, in your notes, uh, I found my wife's um, study guide on 2 Corinthians that she did back in 1999. And uh, she filled that thing. It's an Irving L. Jensen self-study guide. She made it her goal in life to do all the study guides throughout the whole Bible. But I found her 2 Corinthians study guide, and I found in the back six pages of microscopic printing where she found 40 to 50 principles on leadership in this book. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have to put those in there. So I've, I boiled it down to 33 in your notes. And if you are a leader, it's the first topic we're going to cover today. We're going to cover leadership, outreach, and uh, giving. And if you are a leader in any sense or aspiring to be a leader, I encourage you to get into 2 Corinthians. Take that list. Look up the scriptures. Ponder the principles it is a masterpiece on leadership. And the reason is because Paul was having such a difficult time with that congregation that he had to continually explain himself, his motives, his methods. He had to wrestle with them over their trust in him. Therefore, he, quote unquote, opens wide his heart. He says that in chapter six, our heart is opened wide. So if you wanna see the open book of a heart of a leader, 2 Corinthians is a, a great study. Today, I'm going to boil that down to three leadership principles and cover them just here very quickly. For example, the principle of conscience comes up in 2 Corinthians. I call it the conscience principle. Two passages deal with it. Listen to this. Paul says, now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. So he, he calls God to witness to the fact that he had served with a clear conscience as he ministered. He, he could go to sleep at night without you know, wondering or questioning his actions or his motives or his methods. He had a clear conscience. Leaders need to lead with that integrity, that sincerity, that dependence upon God so that you can rest at night and your conscience is just at peace. That's a key leadership principle. He mentions it again in chapter four, but from a different angle of the conscience. It says, therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, this leadership opportunity. We do not lose heart. Rather, we've renounced secret and shameful ways. Leaders should always renounce Secret and shameful ways. Because if you have secret and shameful ways, you will not have a clear conscience. And eventually those things come to the light. We've renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception. We do not distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, Paul says, I lead in such a way that everyone's conscience is okay with me. And, and I think that's an important thing. When you lead, you have to have a clear conscience, but other people have to have a clear conscience toward you. They have to believe in you. They have to believe that your motives are pure, that you have integrity, that you have sincerity, that you're not self-serving, that you're not distorting the truth, that you're not in it for personal gain. So this issue of the conscience is a key principle in leadership. Your conscience needs to be clear and other people's conscience needs to give you a vote of confidence that yes, indeed, we trust you, we can follow you. That principle alone, the conscience principle, could solve so many problems in our world if leaders would just lead with a clear conscience. Then there's the comparison principle. And uh, I love this one because pastors really struggle with the comparison problem. We are always comparing our churches, we're always comparing ourselves, and if we're not doing it, other people are doing it for us. So they'll come up and say, hey, did you hear so-and-so's sermon? And I'm like, no, I didn't hear that one. <laughs> I remember one, one morning really early coming in and getting excited for the first service, and, and somebody came up so excited and said, did you hear Pastor Joel Osteen this morning? 
I'm like, oh yeah, I was up really early listening to Pastor Joel. Osi. It's like, no, I wasn't. But, but the comparison thing, it's just always there for pastors. And so here's what Paul says about this comparison issue. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. For when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. They are not wise, it says in that translation. But I memorized it in the New American Standard a long time ago. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're without understanding. That means the measure of me is not another pastor. The measure of me is not another church. That's not how God works. God wants me to stand and serve for an audience of one, and I'll give an account to him someday, not to another church or to another pastor. It's not a competition. Church world is not a competition to see who can come out on top. And so I encourage you, whatever leadership role you are in or aspiring to, don't fall into the comparison trap where you're measuring yourself by everybody else's performance. It's just not healthy. Serve in the sight of God. Live for an audience of one. Be content as you work hard with the results that God gives to you. Be content. Be faithful. Bloom where you're planted, but don't always be looking around comparing to everybody else. It'll take you down. And by the way, the comparison thing works like this. If you're winning, you'll become proud. If you're losing, you'll become depressed and bitter. Don't do it. Just serve God and let God work out the measure of the results, the comparison principle. And then the third principle of the 33 that are in your notes, I'm, I'm moving quickly because I want to cover three topics today. The cost principle, leaders pay the price in order to lead. And leadership is hard, but it's not, for most of us, as hard as it was for Paul. Paul tells us what his life was really like in chapter 11. Listen to this resume of suffering. I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, and that was one short of 40, which was considered a death sentence. Five times, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, and that's not in a cruise ship. That was floating on a plank of wood after a shipwreck. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of constant concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I don't feel weak. Who's led into sin? And I don't inwardly burn. If I must boast, I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows I'm not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Eratos had the city of the, of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me, but I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. He paid the price to be a leader. He was a great leader. You think Apostle Paul, you think greatness. Yeah, but with that greatness came a lot of cost, a lot of suffering, a lot of hardship. And I want you to know if you're a leader or you're aspiring to be a leader, there's going to be a cost, there's going to be hardship, there's gonna be sleepless nights, there's gonna be criticism, there's gonna be danger, there's gonna be all kinds of things. It's gonna be a roller coaster ride. But leaders, in order to lead, are willing to pay the price and lead by example, even if it's hard. And leaders are not in it really for what they can get out of it. In fact, the greatest sin a leader can commit, I, I heard about it the other day, a UAW, a leader in the UAW, actually taking a million dollars of UAW funds and splurging on a lavish lifestyle. A leader should be paying the cost to lead, not taking everybody else's money and uh, making a great life for themselves at everybody else's expense. If you're a leader, be willing to pay the price do the hard work. Lead with a clear conscience. Lead with a clear conscience. Don't compare to others. And be willing to pay the price and sacrifice, if necessary, to lead well. Those are just three of 33 principles. 
And my wife actually had about 50 in her book, so we've simplified it. But if you're a leader or want to be a leader, I encourage you, spend some time in 2 Corinthians. It's a masterpiece on leadership, and I just want to whet your appetite for it. A second topic that's huge in 2 Corinthians is the sub subject of, of outreach or being ambassadors for Christ. I'll read a passage, then I want to invite somebody else up here to help me with this. It says in chapter 5 that the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ, Paul says, has, has gripped us and compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Let me read that again. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation to the world. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then he gives us the gospel in a nutshell. God made him who had, had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have the message of reconciliation. And that message is from our king, the king of heaven, and that's a message for our world. So we are, we are ambassadors here in this world with a message. And when you've been given a message by your king, you need to share that message. We need to be ambassadors for Christ. And we have the most amazing, amazing message ever. And that is that God put our sins on Christ and then took our sins away. A, a young girl stopped me out by the donut table. Usually, young girls this tall are just scrambling for the donut table. This girl was scrambling to talk to me. And she came up to me and she looked at me and she said, Pastor Bob, I have a question. What would have happened if Jesus had never died? I thought, wow, what a profound question for a little girl that should be eating donuts right now. And I said, if Jesus had never died, our sins would not be forgiven. We would not have new life in Christ. He wouldn't have risen from the dead so that we could have eternal life. And I looked at her and I said, if, if Jesus had never come to die on the cross, my life would be hopeless. And she just looked at me, up at me with her big eyes. She nodded. I said, do you, do you understand? And she said, yes. And then she ran off to get a donut. <laughs> but that's the truth. We have that message. The message that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Are you sharing that message? Instead of talking about this in theory, I want to bring up Kurt Albert. Kurt, come on up. Kurt is our new pastor of outreach here. You know Kurt because he launched our Cody partnership and for the past six years has guided that to such incredible success. And we're going to continue on with that. You're wearing your Cody shirt today. We're still all in in the Cody Rouge neighborhood. But Kurt is our pastor of outreach now. And he is working with me to figure out how we can be more effective at being ambassadors for Christ. So Kurt, thanks for partnering with me. Let me just ask you a couple questions. First of all, why is this so important for a church that we'd be effective as ambassadors for Christ? Why is it such a big deal? Well, it's, it's a big deal because it's a big deal to God, right? He loves us so much. I, um, I'm always drawn back to Genesis chapter three where Adam and Eve sinned, and the first thing that God does is he goes and he looks for them. And if we're gonna have God's heart, then we've gotta share that by the way that we live our lives. So the only way we can be a, a true church, his true ambassadors, That's, is by having God was heart. the first missionary. He yeah. goes in the garden looking for lost people, shouting, where are you? Yeah. Where are you? Yeah. That's awesome. Why is it so hard? Because I've, I've been a Christian 44 years. I think sharing my faith is still the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. And I can do that, you know, when there's a thousand people that, you know, are in a room. But if I'm sitting next to a stranger on an airplane yeah. or going next door, it's harder. Why is it hard for us to share our faith? Yeah. I think, I think for me, one of the things that makes sharing your faith difficult <clears throat> is 
when I think that it's my job to save somebody. Mm-hmm. When I think, I think, well, I, I've got to explain things just right. And if I do it just right, then, then maybe they'll come to faith. But I'm not a savior. Mm-hmm. You know, God is the one who saves. So my job is just to love people well. You know, mm-hmm. God's, God's loved me well. So I can share that love and allow God to do the work in their lives. So, so we put too much pressure on ourselves. For sure. Yeah. So take the pressure off for our people because... Uh, I asked you yesterday about your outreach department and who you have on your staff, and you said, well, the entire church is my department, and they're That's all right. on my team. So Amen. this is your go team. But take the pressure off. What can we do, let's say, between now and summer to just kind of you know, get off the, off the dime here with outreach? What, what are the few things we could do? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, our church does a lot, but I think, I think God wants to stir the waters. I think it's time for us to, to see some great things happen. And, and you've got a card in your bulletin that I want you to pull out real quick. I, I think if we do three simple things, um, we can see God do an amazing, amazing work. The first thing is to identify. And you've got, we've got a question that goes along with our value of outreach. And that question is, who's in my top three? In other words, who are three people that you know and you're not sure what their relationship with God is like, or you know if they, you're not sure if they know who Jesus is, and identify those people. Maybe it's two, maybe it's four, that doesn't matter. Identify some people. The second thing is pray for them. When you pray, God changes your heart. I think of Jesus saying, ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest field. That wasn't so other people would go. That was so he changed my heart. And, when I, I pray. and I once heard, go to God about men before you go to men about God. Yeah. So pray, identify, and then just start praying for those people. Yeah. Okay. And the, the third thing is initiate. Initiate. Yeah. Send a text. Say, hey, you want to go hit a bucket of golf balls? I think you, that's something you'd I'm gonna be ready right to a rally. lot of people to go hit golf balls. I'm never going to do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Tell us but, what you did the other day, though. You, you took somebody well, to a ball yeah, game. Yeah, I took a friend of mine to a Michigan State basketball game. Was it a good game? And, did we win that one or did uh, we lose no, that, that one? That, that, We're Penn, in a kind of a rough stretch Penn, right Penn now. Penn State we won that won. game, okay. yeah. All right. uh, but, you know, and, and this is a guy that, you know, we've connected several times recently. I, we just, you know, texted each other and went out to eat a couple times. And so we went to the game, and, and on the way home, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, uh, Kurt, it's time for a spiritual conversation. Mm-hmm. And so, like you said, this that, oh boy, yeah, oh boy. what am I going to do? <laughs> and so I just said, I said, can you tell me about some of your spiritual experiences? And he looked at me with this funny look on his face like, why are you asking me that kind of a question? Mm. And, but we're friends, right? Yeah. So we talked about it. You already got the relational equity. I already so got the relationship. Yeah, not, not awkward, yeah. Next thing I know, he's asking me all kinds of questions huh. about, about, you know, about faith, about Jesus, about who he is, mm. asking me some tough questions, some, yeah. you know, why, is, why did God allow people to to sin and turn their backs on him mm-hmm. and, and things like that. And yeah. we talked about the fact that God wants people to choose him. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was great, great time. So those three things we could do, we can identify, we can begin to pray yeah. and then just uh, initiate. Yeah. And, and I know one of mine, uh, I think I, I might've told you, but I, I go to Red Olive a lot and there's a waitress. We, we have lots of conversations with the waitresses and they know who we are, that uh, we kind of own stock in Red Olive since we eat right. there so much. And, but uh, they know we're pastors. And, and one, one uh, meal about three weeks ago, one of them came up to me and uh, she said, now you are a pastor, right? And I said, yeah, and so is this one. She said, well, then you need to pray for so-and-so because she's not here serving because she has a stage four cancer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got her name and phone number and I need to now text and call this woman and just tell her I'm praying for her. Yeah. Just something simple and see if God opens up a door. Absolutely. Yeah. How about you pray for us as a church? Uh, we got one more principle we're going to cover very quickly, but pray for us that we'd be effective in yeah. outreach. Yeah, let's pray together. God, we are so grateful that you have demonstrated your love to us in ways that are beyond our wildest imagination. Mm-hmm. Thank you, God, that you are mighty yes. to save. Thank you that you have provided the way for us to have a renewed, a restored relationship with, with you that we can become a new creation. We celebrate mm-hmm. that. But God, there's people all around us that we know that we love. And God, we want them to know you. 
But God, remind us that you love them even more than we could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And God, we just, we commit them to you and we commit ourselves to you as a church. God, stir our hearts. Mm -hmm. Call us up to represent you well everywhere we go, at work, at school, everywhere we go. God, thank you so much for your amazing grace. And God, may it be shown clearly Mm -hmm. so that the name of Jesus is glorified through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kerb. Thank you. I think of the opening line in that passage, the love of Christ compels us. Yeah, for sure. As you were praying, that's got to grip us deeply, the love of Christ for us, and then the realization that that same love is for everybody around us. Absolutely. And if that love controls us and compels us, then we're going to identify, we're going to begin to pray, and we're going to do the the, the risky business of calling somebody or going next door or taking somebody to a game and then just see what happens. Yeah, and we'd, we'd love to know what you're doing. So if you want to snap a picture of your top three and send it to us at go at oakpoint.org or see me out in the atrium, we'd love to hear and what's let's, going yeah, on. And let's collect stories too. Tell yeah. us stories of what's happening. We'll collect stories and we'll tell stories and this will become a place where we're celebrating the wins in this area. Thanks, Kurt. Great. Thanks, Thank Bob. you. The last uh, principle, leadership is big in this book. Outreach is huge in Second Corinthians. The last one, there are two chapters, chapters eight and nine, that are about stewardship, finances, giving, and they're the longest two chapters in the whole Bible on the subject of financial giving. Again, in your notes, uh, if you read those notes, you'll see 13 principles of stewardship that are there for you to learn from. I'll just read a couple passages uh, to you right now and just give you the highlights. It says in chapter eight, he says to the Corinthians, since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, and in the love that we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. It's a grace. Just like other gifts, like the gift of knowledge, the gift of speech, the gift of wisdom, the gift of love, Paul says, excel in this gift that God gives to you, the gift of giving. I'll explain that in a second. He says, I'm not commanding you to give. I just want to test the sincerity of your love. Uh, comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And Paul, through these two chapters, keeps holding up the giving of Christ, how he left glory. He became poor that we might become rich. And what Paul's trying to say, he was, he was engaged in a poverty relief mission for the suffering church in Jerusalem. And he's going to these Gentile churches in Macedonia and Achaia, and he's, he's imploring them to give generously toward the saints in Jerusalem who are suffering. And he's saying, look, look, Jesus Christ was rich, but he became poor so you could become rich. And he's simply asking people who are pretty well off to give some of those riches so that people who are poor could be brought back up and there could be kind of a level playing field. And, and he implores them to excel in the grace of giving. And the reason it's called a grace of giving is because it is a gift from God to be able to give. Here's the deal. In the Bible, we are managers, not owners of our stuff. All throughout the Bible, what we have is God's, and we are stewards of that in our lifetime. That means our position in life, our education, our friendships, our connections, our resources, our stuff, our toys, our houses, our clothes, all of it, our our accounts, our investments, it's all God's. And we are given the opportunity to manage that, to steward that for his glory during our lifetime, and then we'll give an account at the end. And when you start to see that you are a manager, not an owner, and then you start to see, well, this is what God has given to me, it is a gift then to be able to give that back to God's work, which is why King David in the Old Testament, when he was collecting money for the temple, he prayed this prayer, and I'll never forget this one line. He said, who are we that we should be allowed to give so generously. He considered it a privilege, a gift from God to be able to give generously. Lots in this book on giving. He says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not like your arm is being twisted under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful in Greek is the word hilarious. So God loves a hilarious giver. A giver who just delights in it, not, oh, here comes the offering. Oh, they're asking for money. You know, God says, don't even give it. 
If it's under compulsion, don't do that because God wants the gift to be, to be matched by joy in your heart for the privilege of giving. And then Paul ends the entire two chapters with this one line, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That word indescribable is only used by Paul right there in all of ancient Greek literature. He had to invent a word to describe the gift of God. And the word he invented to describe the gift of God is the word indescribable. He just says it's indescribable what God did. And that's the measure of our generosity. I just want to say to you, church, thank you for your generosity. For 23 years, you have given, and we've always hit right at our budget We've always reached our goals. Even this past year, just in the last week, we just get into the black for a new year. Thank you for your generosity. And also thank you for your giving to the next campaign. Our goal, our minimum goal was $10 million. We're now at $10.1 million in pledges. Some of you um, also are wondering, but are people actually giving to those pledges? Over half that money's already in. And so I want you to know that five, a little more than $5 million is actually already there. It's already set aside. If you haven't been part of it, you want to join, uh, just figure out on our website how to, to find it or talk to one of us. We'll, we'll help you get involved. It's a uh, million dollars for new campuses. It's expansions here on this facility and expansions in Milford. And the building teams, the building advisory teams are already working diligently to really take what we have and make a plan that uh, will get us going. We probably won't get everything that we want right out, out from the get-go because the building costs are just going up really fast, but we're going to get started in both locations probably in the next year. So thank you again for your generosity toward that campaign. Uh, we do still have a matching challenge, a half million dollar matching challenge that about 300 or 350,000 has, has come in toward that. If you want to, to join in that match, just know your giving will be doubled. All, all that to say, Paul says, it's a privilege to give. And uh, if you want to learn more about giving, study chapters 8 and 9. It's a great book, 2 Corinthians. I'm sad to leave it. Did you know the song we sang, that, that, that resurrection power song that rocks, you know, we sang, uh, living, we're new on the inside, all, the old is gone, the new has come. He's making us alive by the Spirit. That's all from 2 Corinthians. We wouldn't even have a song like that if it wasn't from, uh, for 2 Corinthians, this great, great letter. So thanks for studying it. And next week, it'll be Joe Seastead. Right now, we're going to take our offering. We're doing everything out of order this week. Um, but we're going to take our offering. And uh, I'm going to pray for that. And then we are going to sing one more song before we walk out. And as you go out, don't forget to uh, say hello to Garland and his friends from the governor's office. Lord, we thank you for this book. I trust that you will take your word and apply it to each heart as you see fit. Thank you for these offerings, the generous offerings of your people. I thank you for what you've given to us to steward in our lifetime, our time, our talent, our treasure, our position, our education, our contacts. It's all from you. And right now we just say thank you for the gift of giving and that we can give back to you. Use these offerings, God, for your purposes in this world, to expand this church, to make Jesus known, to help people everywhere. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you, Jesus, are the indescribable gift. In your name we pray.
God, we thank you for how generous you've been to us. Lord, we praise you for the generosity that you gave us through your son, Jesus. And Lord, help us to give in response of our lives, of our time, of our talent, of our treasure, so that you would be our number one treasure. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. Send us out of this place, sharing you with everybody. Amen and amen. Thanks for being here, everybody. Have a great weekend. Give somebody a hug or a high five on the way out. Maybe introduce yourself and have an awesome weekend.